Thank you very much. It's, um, it's actually not, not just pleasant to meet a lot of our friends and people that we haven't met before but who, who know us, there's all the dudes from the hospital, Daisy here and lots of people. I want to thank them especially for coming along tonight. I haven't met them before but I think we've been friends all our lives. Des and Brian mentioned that we were at the monument yesterday in, in Dublin. Of course it's a nice monument and people take pictures there. But this here is the real monument. This is the monument to madness. This is the monument to man's inhumanity to man. This is the place that you must come to look at and say, this must never happen again. We don't need a stone here. It will always be here. And the monument in Dublin, small as it was, as small as it is, it played a vital part in bringing the Miami Chauvin tragedy back into the public consciousness after 30 long years. Ten years ago, just prior to the 30th anniversary, the names Tony Garrity, Fran O'Toole and Brian McCoy were uppermost only in the hearts and the minds of their families, friends, colleagues and those of us who were with them when they died. Initially, the 30th anniversary was to be marked with an interdenominational service at the Pro Cathedral in Dublin. But subsequently, wearing my day job music promoter hat, I suggested that a Miami Chauvin Memorial Concert could be viable. And if successful, the proceeds could be, and, it, and it, indeed there were, put towards providing the permanent memorial in Dublin. I was blessed with three exceptional partners in that enterprise. The late Paul Ashford, who preceded me as a, a bass player with the Miami. Mikey Hanrahan from Stockton's Wing, who was the lead singer, and at that time he was the chairman of IMRO. And John Murphy, one of those silent people, lives in McCroom that helps everybody and is always there, like many of you, to help people get over their traumas and get through their problems in life. At the concert at Vicar Street, as many of you now know, was a tremendous success. However, while the immediate response to the idea of a 30th anniversary memorial concert had been one of great enthusiasm from the majority of our friends and professional colleagues, and their generosity was indeed overwhelming, one member of our group, one of the family group, asked, will anybody come to this concert? And it was a question which spurred me then and continues to drive me to this day to ensure that Tony and Fran and Brian will never be forgotten. Although that question shook me, it begged a further question. If we don't tell each new generation about such awful events, who will inform the young men and women who are once again spoiling for a fight how will they know what they're about to visit upon their own communities unless they appreciate and understand the consequences of the horror that they're playing with and the horror of violence? There are some today who want us to be silent, who believe we should tone down and sanitize our rhetoric. But if we do, those who planned, facilitated and executed the Miami Chauvin massacre will continue unchallenged to manipulate the foolish and the naive. The Miami Show Band Massacre, as it's called now, was not just an attack on a popular band. It was a calculated attack on the reputation of the Irish people to brand Ireland, all of us, as a nation of terrorists. And had it succeeded, there would be no honouring today of Fran O'Toole, Brian McCoy and Tony Garrity. Had Des or I not survived to tell what happened, our wives and partners would have been labelled the wives and partners of terrorists and perhaps even willing supporters of terrorism. And the children, left to ponder for the rest of their lives if there possibly could have been smoke without fire. Instead of the warmth, respect and love that are so evident here today, the names of Macaulay, Travers, McCoy, 
Geraghty and O'Toole would now be shamed, synonymous with deceit, betrayal of public trust and conspiracy to murder. Difficult as it is for Des and for me to regurgitate the horror that we witnessed as young men on the morning of 31st of July 1975, right here. As difficult as it is for others to hear it repeated, it is our duty to do so. Bearing in mind the words of Edmund Burke, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. We are obliged to openly bear witness to that appalling crime until those who to this day continue to cover up their central role in it, accept responsibility for their actions and the actions of their agents. Only then will we find reconciliation and our ghosts laid to rest. Because of the heroic and painstaking work of Justice for the Forgotten and the Pat Finucane Centre, collusion between state and terrorists can no longer be denied. The genie is well and truly out of the bottle, but now, now is not the time to be silent. We should take a leaf out of the very courageous Anne Cadwallader's book, Lethal Allies, and vociferously expose and openly condemn any ideology, any regime that sanctions the murder of the innocent. In the words of Martin Luther King, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. Finally, I wish to pay tribute to somebody who can't be here today, who at a tender age of 21 was severely traumatized by this awful intrusion on her young life. But she has remained my most constant, faithful, generous and bravest friend of all, my beautiful wife, Anne Travers, without whom I could not have survived. Thank you very much. This has been a bit more difficult than I thought. Thank you, Stephen.